Hey, welcome to the CTO studio. This week I talked to Rob Kaufman, co-founder of Learn Academy, churning out the software developers and getting them employed. I love them because they have their internship program, which is almost like an apprenticeship, and we get deep on productivity. Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO Studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO Studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Rob Kaufman, welcome to the CTO Studio. Thanks, Etienne. You founded a code school. Mm-hmm. It's called Learn, mm -hmm. L-E-A-R-N. Yep. And you're graduating coders. About 20 every two months. That's amazing. Do it's you been also, awesome. Do you also help with the jobs? So the format for learnacademy.org um, is that it's three months full-time in classroom and a one-month placed internship. So we work, I mean, we were with your company since the very beginning. Um, we work with companies all over San Diego to make sure that every single one of our graduates ends the program with work experience, right? So they've done that initial transition. Uh, and what I talk to prospective students about all the time is this idea that the last day of group projects and the first day of your internship should feel like the same thing in a different place. And the last day of your internship and the first day of your full-time job Sometimes it's a different place, sometimes it's the same place. About 40% or so of our students end up staying on with their intern partners, which means no job hunt for them, right? How many percentage? About 40%. That's amazing. Yeah, so it's a, a big percentage a kind of get recruit. done there. Um, and then we offer job services, um, not even just for the first job. Like we've now, uh, see, three years in, we're seeing folks come up for their second job. And so they reach out to us and say, hey, I'm transitioning again. Um, is there anything you can do to help me? Um, and so we, our career service person, Bianca, who's fantastic, um, she used to be a recruiter at Intuit, um, we'll meet with them and do a second resume check and talk about getting the word junior out from in front of their title and really help them even transition. So my goal at Learn and um, Chelsea, our CEO, our, our vision for it is a long-term partnership. It's not come in, learned program, high five, don't call us, right? Like it's this bigger process um, that's gonna take place over the entire career of the people that we get involved with. Yeah, and you're creating this, this beautiful community um, of people who can constantly come back for help and mentorship, right? Right, well, and, and to turn the tables, right? Like to, they're now getting their interns in. Um, and so that's been a really cool thing when you see Learn alumni hiring each other um, and convincing their boss, hey, you should bring these people in. Um, that's really exciting to me. So our, our, the, the whole code school environment is a competitive environment, I imagine. Code schools are competing with each other. I mean, sure. what does the landscape look like now? I think a few years ago it was a bit well, when more... we started, when we, So when we started Learn, it was, like, it was a very much like have to kind of thing. Um, there were no code schools in Southern California. And so um, I went through this process where we had worked with uh, one of the other things I do is I run a consultancy called Notch 8 and Notch 8 has offices in San Diego and in Portland, Oregon. And the Portland office brought in some interns from a code school up there. And uh, we ended up, we had six interns. We hired four of them as junior developers. And that was how we were building our team. So it's like, how do we replicate that in San Diego? Well, there are no code schools in San Diego. There's no code schools in LA. There's no code schools in Orange County. We're going to have to fix that. Um, and I was driving home from SD Ruby one night for the regular Rails meetup, and I was like, well, shoot, if no one else is going to do it, I have to do it. Um, fortunately, uh, my partner Chelsea, her background was in education and in business. It's like, okay, well, we put that passion in education and business with my passion for technology, you get a code school. Like, that's the result of that equation. Um, and so it just felt like the whole universe was screaming at us that we had to start it. Um, and so we were, I mean, we're the only like San Diego based, like started here in San Diego code school out there. Um, and uh, Chelsea grew up here. She's been here her whole life. I grew up in LA, came down in 2005. Um, so we have a really San Diego vibe to us, um, which means things like work-life balance, right? It means things like um, being tapped into the community really deeply. 
Um, and so we've kind of made our niche that way. Um, I feel like one of Learn's big things is that everybody is a person uh, at Learn. You know, we want to talk to each other like adults, right? Life is going to happen while you're doing code school. Um, people have had like family members pass away and need to suspend their time and just come back at a later cohort. And we can work that out, right? Because we can sit down, have a conversation. Um, and I, when we started it, the number of people who would cry in my office was definitely not something that I, I really foresaw. But like life can be really intense sometimes. And so really working with people with where they're at um, has allowed us, I think, to be really successful and to see a huge percentage mm. of our uh, students go on to like find the jobs that they want. Um, cause we're willing to work with them. We're willing to be flexible. And, uh, is the, is the internship month that you tack onto your course, um, is that unusual or is that fairly standard? Uh, it's relatively unusual. It's kind of a lot of work to administer, uh, internship program. And I think a lot of the code schools out there have sort of skipped that, um, and said, Hey, you know, we'll just do, so put you right in the job hunt. Um, the job hunt number is what, or the job employment number is what you live and die by in code schools, right? When you talked about us being competitive, that's what we're competitive about. We're competitive about that number, right? Like I can say really comfortably that Learn is at uh, 84% of our alumni have jobs in software development within six months, and we're super stingy about that number, right? Like if you, uh, so for example, we had an alumni who um, his dad passed away right after the class and he took over the family auto dealership, right? That doesn't count. He didn't get a job as a software developer. Mm. Probably never will. Mm. You know, maybe, maybe not, right? Um, and so uh, we want to be really honest with that number and we want it to be realistic with that number. Mm. And so I know a lot of code schools have gotten in trouble for lying about that number. Uh, and so that's something we just stay completely away from. Well, is that because, is that, be are you attracting people who want to learn how to code or people who want a job? Well, it's both those things, for sure. So they want to learn, they want a career. Right. And so software development is a great career because it uh, has a future that's really obvious. To, you know, there's a huge shortfall in the number of software developers in the industry. And that's why these code schools now exist. Um, and that that need for talent, like people want to do things that they can pour their heart into. They, they can be creative about. Right. So it's this beautiful combination of like it's really in demand. Um, but it's also like can feed your soul a little bit. And so that's what we're looking for in our potential students are folks that want to do something that they can be passionate about and get both. So the, so how many people do you attract that are first, like as far as professional careers, uh, are first time professional career people, or in other words, who've never really had a, a job. Mm hmm versus those that are changing their careers? Most people who come to learn are changing their careers. Um, now, I, I, you know, I, I would say that probably 80% or so have had, and probably, probably more like 90% have had some sort of job, right? They're not fresh out of school. Yeah. But, um, but we see a lot of folks that like maybe are in the first couple years of their career and realize that they've chosen something that they don't like. Um, architects and biologists and all kinds of different walks of life that come out and say, hey, you know, it turns out like I studied to chemistry for four years in college and I don't like working in a lab. Uh, that's a problem, right? And so get that solved ASAP. Um, but also folks that are reentering the workforce after having been out of it for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I love talking to uh, people who like stop to raise kids for, no. you know, 10, 15 years and now they want to come back to the workforce. Like Learn, I think, is a really good I opportunity think, for them. I think one of the people I interviewed at your at Learn was a CEO of a company who had some sort of exit and he just wanted to get back into coding. Yeah, we're seeing. So I would say the like in the Venn diagram of like who comes to Learn, the probably 60%. 65% are 20s and 30s career changers or looking for some sort of their first big career. Um, that other group, that other 30, 40% are folks that maybe they were a software developer in the 80s and they went into management. Or maybe they're a CTO or CEO that are tired of trying to do the almost impossible task of finding a technical co-founder and want to know enough about software development so that they can be their own technical co-founder. And they're not going to write every line of code for their next startup, 
but they want to know what the developers are saying. Um, and you know, there are plenty of startups out there that have lost their shirt uh, working with developers that either weren't honest or just didn't know enough. And so they want to at least like talk the talk. Mm. So do you, how, how involved are, do, are you actually teaching classes? I am not currently in the classroom, um, which is for the best. Uh, the instructors we have are fantastic. They do a really awesome job of letting the students come to their own answers. Um, I get impatient and I say, here, give me the keyboard. Let me show you all the things. Um, and it's something I've been working on personally a lot over the last few years. Um, I know that it's so much better for them if I just ask questions and help like draw it out of them. If I solve your problem, that's one thing we get past the problem. But if you solve your problem, like you keep that forever. Um, and so our instructors right now are just, they're, they're phenomenal at that part. How, how much of what, of what they learn is around being a active contributing member of a team? In other words, this, the collaboration skills, the emotional intelligence, all that stuff. That's a huge, huge part of what we do. So our structure, um, they're sort of learning fundamentals. And then there's learning how all the pieces fit together. And then there's group projects, which are really designed to, to help you do it as, as, a, as a group. Um, but you're pairing from day one. Um, and so because we do so much pairing in the classroom, you're talking about code all the time. People always talk about writing code as the discipline of software development. That's a tiny fraction of what you do as a developer. Most of the time you're reading code or thinking about code or talking about code way more than the writing of it. You know, and so um, we really drive that deep into the heart of the curriculum. So as I mentioned, the other thing I do is software consulting. And so Nachi drives the learn curriculum, right? So whatever we need at the consultancy as someone who's hiring the people coming out of this program, like goes immediately back into learn. And so um, my goals for a learn grad are incredibly selfish, right? Like I should want to hire every single person that comes out of learn. Um, and because we're constantly driving that into the process, um, it means that the folks coming out of learn are useful to not just myself, but also to other people who are running development teams on day one. He created an open ecosystem for himself. Yeah, I'm just really lazy about hiring. That's really what learn is about. You know, when I, when I hire uh, code school grads, I just assume that they can code. Okay. And that the rest of it is around uh, problem solving team and all that. And, and sometimes I am surprised at how little they really know. Uh, and not, not so much, um, you know, not so much about coding and all that, but more about uh, you know, if there is, if there's an environment or a context that is really out of what their comfort zone, mm -hmm. uh, that in and of itself is a skill that isn't completely developed yet. Sure. And so one, one, one must not forget that when they're outside of that, uh, you know, it, it does require some coaching and mentoring. Yeah. I think that as an employer, I think that fundamentally that bringing in junior folks requires mentorship and structure. Um, at Notch 8, we found that uh, we have to be careful with the ratio. You can get too top heavy with junior talent, right? You could say, let's say you have six junior developers for every senior developer. Well, that senior developer is going to spend all their time answering questions and doing the mentorship side, and they don't get any time to actually do the development themselves. That doesn't work great. Um, whereas if you keep it at a two to one or three to one ratio, um, then the junior devs feel more comfortable because they're getting more of the mentorship they need. And the senior devs are feeling more comfortable because they're, you know, uh, tempering that mentoring mm. with their own productivity. Um, and so you have to find that balance. Mm. And that, that's a really critical part, I think, of the equation. What, what is the difference between a junior developer and a senior developer? Time. I love it. More than anything. So one of the things that is characteristic of when you're first starting development is you get stuck all the time. Right, And the difference between a senior developer and a junior developer isn't that the senior developer gets stuck less. Right? That's what people think is, oh, they, they must know more so they don't get stuck as often. You get stuck just as often. You just learn how to get unstuck faster. Right, That process of, oh shoot, I don't know this. Okay, I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna try that, I'm gonna try this. 
It's all just the scientific method. You make a hypothesis, you figure out how to test that hypothesis, you run the experiment, you draw a conclusion, right? And the speed at which you do that goes up over time. That's the difference. Is And is that is that something that code schools teach? Is that that whole hypothesis experimentation sort of cycle? We, we do. It's a very yeah. deep part of yeah. our program. We want you to learn how to solve problems because we know... And you know this from interviewing people, right? Like, you don't really care if they know how to fizz buzz. You don't really care if they know the bubble sort algorithm. Like, who cares? You look that up on Wikipedia, right? You care about what they're going to do when they run into a problem they don't know the answer to. Because the one thing you're guaranteed as a software developer is your life is going to be full of problems that you don't know the answer to. You know, uh, I did some research on this as we're doing our 1618 hackathons. Mm -hmm which is the computer science hackathons. And have you ever heard of the concept of a naive algorithm? Yeah. What about it? Just that uh, um, uh, junior people or inexperienced people tend to grab the first sort of brute force iterative algorithm. Sure. And don't step back to say, okay, well, there's the naive algorithm, but then there's the, the right way to do this or a, a more... Well, it's more elegant, right? And or, more, if, uh, more, uh, you know, p more efficient. Did you ever do wood shop as a kid? Was that part of no, I think school? We were, we were hunting lions and chasing okay. crocodiles. All right. So the first time you went out to hunt lions, like you make your spear, and your spear is going to be like really. Well, kludgy, no one right? would hunt a lion with a spear. That was that's just those kids got eaten up quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I guess lion hunting is out of my personal frame of reference. But the first time you make like a, a craft or an art, right? Like it's going to be really kludgy. And you can get it done, but it's like the seams aren't going to be tight, right? The edges aren't going to be crisp. Like that comes with experience and practice. Um, and so I think that, you know, with your 1618 program, with our Dev Pass program, they're both trying to find ways to sort of take these like rougher initial raw developers and temper them faster. Right? We know from the literature and from studies that are out there that it takes about 10 years for someone to go from junior to senior. Right, There are tons of junior developers coming into the market, which we desperately need. But the, we talked a few minutes ago about how you need a certain number of senior developers for every junior developer. So we're going to need to cut that in half. Right, we, we don't have 10 years. We have five years. I don't think you can cut it to instant until we get the like matrix, like I plug the thing in the back of your head and now you know Python. Right. Um, but we can make it shorter. And so I think that by offering uh, like additional continual learning, that that can really help um, speed that process up in a big way. So tell me about the dev pass. So dev passes, um, we've been experimenting since we got started on what do we do after you've graduated from learn to help you move forward through that journey faster. Um, and dev pass is our most recent iteration of that. And the big thing is, um, it's designed so that each month there's a new topic um, and they're specialty topics. So you can say, okay, well, I want to go deep on this one specialty topic. What we found is that because these people are busy professionals, software developers, that they can't commit to a lot, right? So it's two nights a week. and Two it's nights a week? Two nights a week. That's and a it's, lot. And it's just for the month. Right, and then that's the end of that topic. And then, and, and so you can take the next one if you want to, oh. or you can go wait for the, the one after that. So the first one we just wrapped up was DevOps, uh, and we learned about Ansible, and we learned about deployment, and we learned about what kinds of things you need to monitor on a production server to make sure that somebody doesn't come in like steal your server and mine Bitcoin with it. Um, and so the next one we're doing is Ionic mobile development, and the one after that will be data science. Um, and so we're basically, we're taking this huge broad spectrum of all the topics you might know around development and saying, okay, let's go deep on one of these each month. And so folks can kind of come and go as they please. And so uh, the, um, uh, the, this is assuming that employers aren't coaching or already uh, augmenting people's skills, right? Or is this a service to employers or a service of, of, of code school grads? It's, it's both things. Or is it a service to for sure. the, the, the grads? So the, it's a great way for employers to like take a team and say, hey, like we know we have this React Native project coming up. A dev pass is doing a React Native month in three months. Let's send the team to that. Right. Like that's a great thing. You know, we'll let them come in late two days a week. 
Uh, it doesn't cost us very much. It's relatively inexpensive. Uh, that's a that's a really good solution to that kind of problem. Um, whereas at the same time, for the individuals, like it may be that they just want to keep growing and sharpening their own skills. So mm. it's really a, a mix fundamentally. Um, the idea is mostly it's tough not to crack right people are busy they can't commit you know they can only do so much your brain gets tired at some point in the day and so finding that right balance is something we've been doing a lot of experimentation with and so is it self-guided or do you have a tutor or is it... uh so typically our goal for the three-hour session is it should be um 30 minutes or less of instruction so it's almost all exercise based um the thing we model it the most after is like a crossfit gym Right. So you might come in and you like learn the exercise for the day, but then you're you're out there doing your reps on that exercise um, kind of on your own. And the instructor is circulating around and making small corrections. Um, so it's very much like that, except for your brain. And is it available to non learn students? Absolutely. So the last class we just wrapped up was one third learn alumni one third soft stack alumni and one third UCSD alumni. That's beautiful. Yeah, it was really cool to get everybody in a room together um, and to hear their like comparative war stories yeah, about yeah. code school was yeah. really neat. That's fantastic. So I want to I want to move to uh, something that I'll never forget when I saw you speak at SD Ruby, uh, which this must have been um, what's what's 2018 minus 10. No, minus nine. So that'd be... 2009. 2009. You mentioned something about... Were you there? Was it? Am, am I right? That's about right. You mentioned something about you take Fridays to clean up your emails, your to-do list. Sure. And um, it was kind of a shocking concept to me that you would spend a day... This was back then. Things yep. obviously have changed, maybe. But... Um, I, I kind of see you as a bit of a productivity nut and I'd love for you to share some of your productivity hacks with us. So tool sharpening is super important, right? If you're um, a woodworker, you're going to make jigs and you're going to make, um, you know, special clamps and different things for different projects that you're or working on. Or as a young on. South African, you're going to sharpen stones. Sure. Um, <laughs> you're setting your whole country like back. <laughs> Century Satyan. Um, okay, so... By the way, ABBA is huge in South Africa right now. I think they're on tour. ABBA is ABBA on tour? ABBA has like two number one singles. Already? No, they just came out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so, apologize to all my South African friends. Okay. <laughs> I think you just got banned in the I entire in continent of Africa right there. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, so it's important to take time to work on your tools. And as developers, like our text editors, like we're always installing new plugins and trying out new browsers and playing with new stuff. And what I found was, um, you know that little pop-up that says, oh, this app wants to update, do you wanna do it right now? That every time you click that button, there's a risk, right? That, that your flow is gonna be interrupted, your, like the thing Seems you're trying to rebooting. work on, it might reboot your whole machine, it might stop working, like, you know, whatever. And so what I do is I put all that stuff off to Friday. And so on Fridays, I go through and I update all my applications. You I still usually, do that? Oh, yeah. After nine so years? So at Notch Eat, at the consultancy, we bill a 32-hour week. So our expectation is that every developer will bill 32 hours in the week, and that should leave us approximately eight hours for learning days. The reason I say approximately is like maybe we have a company meeting, or maybe you have to go to the dentist, or like all the crap that happens during the week. If you try and bill a 40-hour week, then you're really working a 50- or 60-hour week. So our goal is to work a 40 hour a week. So we build a 32 hour week and then we use that learning time as our sort of our slop, right? As our, our margin. And um, by doing that, you get time to do things. So at Friday morning, typically I will, I have a update software that checks out all my applications, updates them. Then I shut my machine down and I usually clean it because I like live and sleep with this thing in front of me all the time. Like I probably spend 16 hours a day on my MacBook and so like it's filthy by the end of the week. So I clean the screen, I clean the keyboard, then I boot it back up and then I'll do whatever learning activities I have for the day. So um, like for example, this last week, I uh, spent my Friday digging into um, some new Docker stuff um, that I wanna do for my DevOps chops, right? Um, I know that my whole team met today uh, to talk about uh, testing in React Native. 
and did a little workshop on testing in React Native. So we're always improving ourselves and we're always like, that's when you play with new text editor tools. That's when you play with that, that cool app that you saw advertised on your feed reader that you like, can't wait to get your hands on. I put all that stuff off to the end of the week. Um, but it's also the time that I like clean off the dishes on my desk and like just mm. make sure that everything's like wrapped up for the week. Do you have like a SOP for that day? Not really. Um, I think that as a team, we meet in the morning briefly to talk about what everyone wants to do. Um, and that uh, is really mostly to form groupings, right? If someone says, oh, I want to learn about testing in React Native, then that gives everyone on the team an opportunity to be, oh, that's cool. I want to do that with you, right? Um, okay. Because, you know, learning is often better together. Um, and then if you are like, eh, that doesn't really interest me, like there's nothing that like forces you to do that. So you just showed me before this interview that you and your wife have a Trello board for household tasks. Yep, absolutely. So we keep a Kanban board for like stuff around the house that works very similarly to the sort of iteration structure that we use uh, in software development. So I've agiled a lot of my life. Um, and what we, I mean, we meet typically for 15 minutes once a week and do a quick stand up on what the week is ahead. Like a lot of those principles of like running an efficient, like collaborative team are things that we've kind of brought into our household. So do you, so there's, I think there's a book written about families having meetings. I forget what it's called, but it's um, literally a family having a weekly meeting about what they've done and achieved and all that stuff. For instance, if a husband has an issue with a wife to bring it up at the meeting and not to kind of get all like, crazy and emotional. Or, okay. Which I think that's pretty insane, but that's, that's you know, that, that's a way to do things. It's all about finding what works for you in yes. your relationship. Right? So my question to you is, do you, uh, do you, do you say to Chelsea, okay, it's time for our family stand up? So we, or does it just, is it just like, oh, I guess we're having our stand up now or. So it really comes from when I very first started Notch 8. Um, and the big fear my partner had at the time was of not having enough work, right? So to her, when she was growing up, her dad was an architect and he lost his job. And so the period that he was consulting was the period that he was unemployed, right? Like that was code for being unemployed. And so she had a lot of fear around that because it happened when she was a like preteen teenager and she's really worried about it. And so we would meet once a week and talk about Notch 8 and naturally an extension of that meeting was like, what else was going on? Um, so one of the very first things I did when I went independent was I stopped working Monday mornings because Monday mornings suck. So I just skipped them. So Monday morning I would like do a little paperwork and I would go grocery shopping and I would meet for lunch and have that meeting. And so from that was sort of this natural extension. Um, and then years later when I met Chelsea, um, she really liked the structure of that um, and also kind of wanted to know a little bit about what was going on at Notch 8 because it's kind of a crazy thing sometimes. Uh, it always feels a little feast and famine. Um, and we always knew that we were going to start businesses together. So we just sort of started into that rhythm from the very beginning and our whole relationship, we've had that sort of structure. Mm. Do you have it on your calendar? Mm -hmm. Your stand up, your family stand up? Yeah. So let me let me end off with um, this whole concept of Fridays again. Um, if I am a busy software developer, software leader, tech leader, CTO, and I feel like there aren't enough hours in the day, mm -hmm. and I'm working you know 50, 60 hour weeks, and I hear what Rob has to say about this and. One of my other friends calls these genius days where you, 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 you spend the day focusing on your genius. Okay. And that could be going into the mountains, going, mm -hmm. into, you know, how do, so I don't do any of that, but I feel like I need to do that. Okay. So how do I introduce that into my life? Well, I think that you and I are kindred spirits in the uh, do all the things. Right. Um, there were some beer commercials in the 90s where they would like one person wants to watch figure skating. The other person wants to watch like monster truck rallies and you would bang the beer on top of the TV and you say, let's do both. And then you'd have like a ballet monster truck rally. Right. That they would show. And I feel like that I do that a lot where I'm like, well, I could do this thing or I could do that thing. Why don't I just do everything? And I think that you probably fall in that same boat 
And the thing that I think really you have to distill from that is to fit what fits in the week and put off the rest. Um, and I struggle with that a lot. I'm not going to pretend like I don't. So I have a box and whatever fits in the box. Those are the things you, you do. It's and the, not like I am going to find a thing that can carry all the things. Right. Like you can't just keep making a bigger box and that you have to, that, that takes a little bit of planning, right? Like it takes an hour Monday morning to be like, okay, this is this week's box. These are all the things I could put in this week's box. What fits? And then when you don't do that planning, then you're trying to juggle all of it. And the context switching costs us way more than we think it does. And this is something that as I've grown both companies um, that has gotten harder, right? There's so many people tugging on my sleeve being like, hey, Rob, can I have five minutes? Hey, Rob, can I have five minutes? That's really tough um, to protect that time. So I have headphones that have a sticker on them that say Slack me. And when I wear those headphones, you don't like if you want to talk to me, you, you should send me a Slack message. And then like, you have Slack turned off. Yeah. And then when I'm done with my, you know, hour long Pomodoro, like timer goes off, then I check Slack and catch up on all the things. And I, you know, and I tell people when I, they come onto the team, like I'm a little bit of a jerk about that, right? Like wow. I'm literally, you're going to come up and try and ask me a burning question. I'm going to point at the sticker on my yeah, headphones yeah. and I'm going to keep programming. And I know him long enough to, when he says a little bit of a jerk, yeah, I'm not messing around there. No. Like I, no, and so, and that, but, I admire that. But you that. tell people about it ahead of time so they know that it's not like them. It's not like, oh, I don't want to talk to you. I'm ignoring you. It's that I have to have focus time or I can't get anything done, right? And then my box gets smaller. So it, that's been, you know, a constant war in my life is just trying to keep things fitting into the box because if you once you start to let it overflow, then like you come into work tired because you work late the night before and you don't get as much done. So you work late that night and you come into work the next day even more tired. I'm a second generation software developer. Um, I grew up with my dad working for NASA and I know what burnout looks like. I watched like his friends burning out and him burning out it's from time to time. So I know what all those symptoms are and I know how much it can cost you. Um, and so you have to actively fight against that. Like that has to be a constant thing. That I think is profound being active and about that. I appreciate that. I mean, it's it's your life, right? Like that's the, um, what's the quote that life is what happens while you're making all those other plans. Um, so you have to be deliberate about it, I think. Thanks, Rob. What, yeah. I, what, I, what I always love about you is the deep knowledge you have on technical stuff and programming and you're still actively coding and you're still the guy who can fix anything in my <laughs> mind and then also these life lessons you've been through a lot you have a lot of experience and uh you know sometimes when i cry on his shoulder he always seems to have the right answer for me well you know for me it's i've had really awesome mentors right like i've gotten mentorship from you i've gotten mentorship from our mutual friend patrick but also from a variety of other folks throughout my career and that that has really um, set me up in a place that has been really helpful. When I was 17, I took a like college extra credit class on like how to run a small business. And most of the class was a waste of time, right? But the things that I learned about were all of the forms you're supposed to fill out to legally run a business. Um, and, and the big thing was the one of the instructors really emphasized the idea of mentorship and community. And I've gotten so much out of that advice, like that if you take care of the community around you, they then in turn take care of you. And that um, that investment just pays off over and over and over mm. again. Worst to live by. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Adrian. Rob. Cheers. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at 7CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So thank you for listening.